Hello everyone, I'm Jacob Kaufman, I'm the Nerd in the Street, and today I'm explaining how I helped fix a GStreamer bug with FLAC files. All right, everyone, so this was not something I did with the intention of making a video. It was more an organic result of the fact that I've been using open source software for a long time, combined with my new role at work that has me filing bug reports more often. Now, back in January 2019, I made a video about ripping and tagging CDs using Linux. I had just gotten the Psychopass 2 soundtrack, a physical set of CDs, and I ripped those CDs in WAV format, then I wanted to convert the files to FLAC format so that I can embed cover art and tags like the album name into the files. Now like I discussed in that video, FLAC files use lossless compression, so they have a smaller file size than WAV files, but they do not result in any loss of quality. Now, I'm not an audiophile, and back when I was doing that, I didn't want to worry about all of the command line options for creating a FLAC file. I wanted something easy to use that would let me click a button to convert WAV files to FLAC files without worrying about potentially losing quality or getting suboptimal compression because I selected the wrong options. I found a program called Sound Converter. It's part of the GNOME project, and I attempted to use it. Now here's what I said about Sound Converter in my previous video. The GUI program I landed on was called Sound Converter, and it's based on GStreamer. That ended up biting me in the butt. I had all these issues tagging my FLAC files after I made the FLAC files. Sound Converter can take an entire directory full of WAV files and convert them into FLAC files. But when I was trying to tag them, the tags were getting saved, but then they weren't being read by any of my programs. And I thought I was doing something wrong. I thought that the tagging program was doing something wrong. I thought that something somewhere, the programs reading the tags were doing something wrong. I did not suspect that Sound Converter was what caused the issue. I went with the nice cushy GUI program to do what I wanted to do for me with not a lot of settings on the screen because it looked easy. And that ended up biting me in the butt because whatever Sound Converter does to make its FLAC files, it creates FLAC files that are problematic. I'm not going to call them broken because they do work, uh, but they're problematic in that KDE libraries and applications cannot read the metadata from files created by Sound Converter. And I'm not going to call the KDE programs broken because they seem to be working fine when I convert those files on the command line using FLAC or SOX, um, or when I opened up a file in Audacity and saved it as a FLAC file and then went and assigned tags to it, KDE was reading the metadata just fine. I can't say that the files were broken definitively, but I can say that whatever GNOME Sound Converter was doing was producing files that were unusable for me. I wanted to give that very explicit warning not to use GNOME Sound Converter. I was having so many problems getting tags to show up in KDE Elisa and Dolphin on my computer and on my Android phone. Um, and once again, it ended up being the sound converter thing, but I spent hours and hours trying to figure out why my files weren't displaying their metadata. So I referred to what happened that time as a wild goose chase, where I spent a bunch of time troubleshooting other programs trying to figure out why they weren't displaying my tags. But in the end, it turned out that Sound Converter was producing FLAC files that were playing back, letting me save tags to them, but not showing the tags in certain programs. Fast forward a year and a half, we're now in June 2020, and I've just purchased a video game soundtrack on Steam. Now this video game soundtrack came in WAV format. The creators of the game released the soundtrack, but they did not create an album cover for it, and there were also some files in the actual game that were not present in the soundtrack. Now, I like to keep albums the way their creators intended them when the creators actually put work into curating them, but in this case, the creators of the game literally said, yeah, we didn't plan on releasing this soundtrack, but we had a couple people ask for it, so here are the files. And they put it up for a buck fifty during the Steam summer sale. Now the game itself was a visual novel coded in RinPy, an open source library, so I ended up extracting some art out of the game, making my own album cover for this soundtrack, and I added in a disc 2 of the soundtrack with all of the music that was present in the game, but not released as part of the official soundtrack. 
Now, I still wanted this sound jack to look nice and professional next to the rest of my collection, so of course I was going to tag it properly. I opened up the directory in KID3, that's the KDE tagging program that I use, and I went to add the tags and the cover art. But then I remembered that WAV files can't hold that kind of information. So I remembered the research I had done in the past and that I needed to convert the WAV files to FLAC files. Now here's where things get really stupid. I opened up the directory in Dolphin. I tried to remember how I did it last time, but I couldn't really remember the exact commands that I used, and I vaguely recalled that I went with some sort of GUI option so that I wouldn't have to worry about the command line flags. I right-clicked on one of the WAV files, I went to open with, and right there in the list, I saw Sound Converter. And I thought, oh yeah, I used that last time because I wanted something simple and it was super straightforward. So I opened up Sound Converter, which I still had installed on my computer from last time. And I dragged in all of the WAV files and converted them to FLAC. I opened up KID3, applied all of my tags. Then once I had everything looking nice, I copied the directory into my personal music folder and I opened up KDE Elisa. Elisa listed the album, but it only had four tracks listed and they were the four tracks that were mp3 files that I had pulled from the game files. None of my FLAC files were showing up. I also noticed that none of the FLAC files were showing their cover art in Dolphin either. So for the second time, I assumed this was some sort of problem with KDE's libraries not being able to read the FLAC tags properly. Now that was kind of an easy assumption to make because I also had Quad Libet and Lollipop installed on my computer, and both of those programs saw the FLAC files with all of the tags that I added. So if it works in several other unrelated programs, but it doesn't work in KDE programs, then the logical assumption is that it's a problem in KDE. I looked in the Elisa bug tracker a bit, but fortunately I didn't spend too much time on it because it was a weeknight and I had to work the next day. Now while I was lying in bed that night, I actually remembered, hey, didn't I have a problem with sound converter last time and I ended up not using it? Total like shower thought kind of thing. And then the next day I looked up my own video about ripping and tagging CDs on Linux and I heard myself talking about how sound converter creates problematic files and I saw that I even marked sound converter with a use with caution message in the description of that video. Now this time I wasn't really content to just move on and use another tool. I recently started a new position at work. I'm a quality assurance engineer. And when I find an issue, I have to report it and provide enough information for the developers to be able to fix it, or at least I have to understand why it's happening. And I figured, FLAC files, how hard can it be? I've got working files and non-working files. I should be able to compare them and find out what's wrong. So I basically did what I do a lot, and for the next couple of days, I clocked out of work, and then I turned around and did almost the exact same thing in my free time. The first thing I did was took a look at Sound Converter's bug tracker. I don't think I even did that last time. I definitely looked at the Elisa bug tracker last time since I'm familiar with KDE's bug tracking system, but this time I looked up Sound Converter to see if anybody else had reported the issue, and if not, to open up a bug report myself. Now, Sound Converter does something really interesting where it uses Launchpad for all of its development. If you're not familiar with Launchpad, it's hosted by Canonical, the company that makes Ubuntu, and it's used almost exclusively for Ubuntu-related projects. Usually when a project is using Launchpad, they're using it to host a PPA, a personal package archive, that basically lets the project ship dev files for Ubuntu users themselves without having to submit the dev files to upstream Ubuntu and follow Ubuntu's release cycle. But Sound Converter is not just using Launchpad to host packages, they have actually turned off issues on their GitHub profile, and they're using the Launchpad bug tracker instead. Really interesting setup. So there were 86 bugs open when I went to check if anybody had reported the flat tagging issue. That sounds like a lot, but it was only two pages and it really didn't take me that long to skim through all the titles for anything flak tag related. I found one issue that caught my attention. It wasn't somebody having issues with FLAC files in KDE Elisa, it was somebody who was having trouble editing FLAC tags in Synology Audio Station. Synology Audio Station saw the files and it could actually play the files, unlike Elisa, but it couldn't edit the FLAC tags. And just like me, they reported that Synology Audio Station was able to edit FLAC tags for files created using the FLAC command line program. It was just files created using Sound Converter that were showing the issue. Now, the maintainer of Sound Converter, Gaudier Porday, who's been maintaining Sound Converter since he took it over from the original author in 2005, replied to that bug in 2016 and said, Sound Converter does nothing special concerning tags. So this can be an issue with GStreamer, but it seems unlikely. He basically suspected this was user error with the permissions on the Synology NAS. 
But of course, I knew something weird was going on from firsthand experience, so I was more interested in the GStreamer comment. GStreamer is an extremely popular multimedia engine. Anyone who's been using Linux on the desktop for a long time has probably heard of GStreamer. There are a lot of programs like the default GNOME video player Totem, and even KDE's multimedia API Phonon that use GStreamer as a backend engine for playing back audio and video files. I usually skip GStreamer-based programs and use an app like MPV or VLC myself, because they usually have more comprehensive codec support out of the box than GStreamer-based programs. So I had an idea of what GStreamer was. The Sound Converter author said that Sound Converter didn't do anything special concerning tags, and I took a quick look at the Sound Converter source code to confirm that. What I found was that when you use Sound Converter to make a FLAC file, Sound Converter just calls the FLAC Inc encoder in GStreamer, passing in a few options, including the compression level option that's exposed as a drop-down box in the GUI. So next, I looked up FLAC Inc. It was pretty easy to find the GStreamer documentation page for Flack Inc. through a web search, although GStreamer's documentation is hosted at freedesktop.org, and I've actually had multiple periods throughout the past few weeks where freedesktop.org's documentation pages have gone down for an hour here or there, which made things slower sometimes. I wanted to try converting a WAV file to Flack using GStreamer on the command line to test if it also showed the issue. The Flack Inc. documentation page had some examples that I, frankly, did not understand. There was one example showing how to to encode a sine wave and two examples showing how to rip CDs, but there weren't any examples for converting a different file type to FLAC, so that was the first thing I had to figure out. So right now I'm going to cut to the desktop and show you a few things. First I'm going to demonstrate the issue I was having with Sound Converter so you can see it firsthand, and then I'm going to show you the syntax for converting files with GStreamer on the command line, and also how I found the exact GStreamer syntax that Sound Converter was using. Alright guys, so here we are on the desktop. Now here I have a file, you can see it's called grumpy.wave, and this is a file that I pulled from the game files. We can open it up, and you can see that it's playing. Now you can see MPV is not showing me any cover art right now, and at the top of the window it just says grumpy.wave. Now what I want is for it to show me cover art, and for the top of the window to say the name of the song, because if MPV isn't showing me those things, then KDE Elisa certainly won't either. So step one, I'm going to right click on this file, and I'm going to select Open With Sound Converter. And that opens up Sound Converter with this one file in it. I'll go to my settings, and I'll set it to output to the same folder that I'm currently in. You can see I have it set to convert to FLAC with the best possible compression, which just takes longer to encode, but doesn't actually lose any quality. Now we'll close out of that. I'll click Convert. And now here we have our FLAC file. Next, step two, I'm going to right click on the FLAC file, I'll go to open with KID3, and I'll add my tags. Now KID3 is a KDE application, so you can see it has a lot of buttons, but we can ignore most of it, and I'm just going to add in these items. We've got our title, our artist, I'm going to use the name of the game development studio, the album name, track number, and disc number. And finally, I'm also going to drag my cover art into KID3 here, and I'm going to save that. So now I can close KID3, and if I open this file up in MPV, you can see it's got my nice cover art. And this game was a parody of something else, it's kind of a silly game, but you know, this was my real world use case, so that's what I'm showing you. You can see at the top of the window, the window title says Grumpy Game Version, as opposed to just the file name. So here's where everything gets crazy. We can see right here in MPV that the tags and the cover art are working properly because MPV can read them. I can also open this up in VLC. And if I go to Tools, Media Information, you can see right here that the artist and the album tags are also populated. We've got our track number here. But if I close out of that, and I open this up in KDE Elisa, you can see that it just says grumpy.flac here at the top. There's no album or artist name, and there's also no album art. Even though KDE Elisa is a very visual program, and there should be album art here, here, and in the background here. And if I copy that file into my music folder, and then I open up Elisa, I can search for stay stay, and you can see there are no results because Elisa didn't index this file. Now just to show you, I can come back here to Dolphin. I can open up a terminal and I can run the flat command. And I'm going to run that command with grumpy.wave as the source. And the output is going to be grumpy-cli.flack. 
So I've just created a flack file using the flack command. I can open this file up in kid3. I can add my tags and I can add my cover art. I can save that. And you can see after I've saved it, the dolphin actually shows the cover art as this file's icon. And if I copy this file into my music folder, and then I open Elisa up, you can see at the top right, it says imported one track. And then if I search for Stay Stay, the track is here, it has album art, I can play it, it has all of its tags. So I tagged these two files the exact same way. Why can Elisa read one of them and not the other? You have to see this yourself to really understand how obscure the issue is. So now, like I said, I'm going to show you how I tested this using GStreamer on the command line. I found a couple of pages on tuxtweaks.com that got me started, so shout out to them. You can see they had one file on converting FLAC files to OGG, and one on converting FLAC to MP3. Neither of these are what I wanted to do, but they demonstrate how to use GStreamer on the command line to convert a file. Now GStreamer has something called a pipeline. So we've got the command itself, GST launch, and then the options for that command make up the pipeline. Now I'm running Arch Linux and on my computer, the actual command is GST launch 1.0, not just GST launch. I figured that one out with tab completion. And you can see what a pipeline looks like here. It's made up of a number of different steps and it basically passes the audio along, takes it from the source file, decodes it, converts anything it needs to convert, then encodes it into the destination format. I couldn't find any examples on how to convert WAV to FLAC, so for that I went looking in the source code of Sound Converter because I figured it had to be there somewhere if Sound Converter used GStreamer. So I looked on GitHub and you can see here that there's a file called gstreamer.py that sounds pretty promising. And if we look inside of there at line 262, this is where we execute the gstreamer command. Now you can see there's not actually a gstreamer command in here because the command is going to change based on what format you're converting to and what options you selected. And the options themselves are set in other files. Inside of ui.py, we take the GUI options and we convert them into textual settings. And if we search in the gstreamer file for flac, you can see on line 633 where we're plugging those options into part of a GStreamer pipeline. Now that's not the entire pipeline, but if we come back up to line 262, I notice this line right here, logger.debug launching and then command. So this line is logging a debug message that shows us what command is being used. That's perfect because I want to see what option sound converter is passing into GStreamer in the command. So if we open up our terminal and we type sound converter dash dash help, you can see we have a dash dash debug option available. I love it when programs make this available. There are some programs that you have to recompile with debugging enabled, but this one's making it easy for us because it's just a command line option. So I'm going to run sound converter dash dash debug, and I'm going to drag in my wave file. I'm going to make sure that my options are still good and I'll convert that. And back here in our terminal, you can see this line launching and then our GStreamer pipeline. Now using this GStreamer pipeline is as simple as copying this entire section inside of the single quotes and then typing in GST launch 1.0 and pasting this in. Just to demonstrate that it works, I'll go ahead and delete the grumpy.flack file and then we'll run this command and you can see that this comes back. Now the file has a different name because Sound Converter uses a temporary name and then renames the file to .flack once the conversion's actually finished but I can rename this to .flac myself. We can open it up and you can see that it plays. So let's take a closer look at this GStreamer pipeline. The first thing we have here is our input. The input in this case is GIO source. Now Sound Converter is a GNOME application, so it uses GIO, which is a GNOME library for accessing files. But as we can see here in the Tux Tweaks article, GStreamer has its own file source option we can use instead. I wanted to simplify things as much as possible, so we can actually change GIO source to file source, and we can just remove the file at the beginning of this location. And since this file path is in quotes, we can actually replace all of these percent 20s with actual spaces. 
It works either way. I think using spaces looks nicer because we're using the quotes anyway. So now we have our readable file name. And then the exclamation mark here signals that we're passing along the audio to the next step in the GStreamer pipeline. And the next step is decoding that source file. We're using a pretty generic item called decode bin here, and GStreamer's documentation explains this will automatically use whatever decoder is most appropriate for the input. So since we're using a wave file as input, decode bin will automatically use a wave decoder. Next, we have the audio rate item. This just makes sure that we have a continuous stream of audio. If you have an input format that uses timestamps and the timestamps have gaps, audio rate will insert samples to fill in the gaps, or if there are duplicate timestamps, it will drop some of the samples so there are no duplicates. This is more useful for formats like AVI that use timestamps a lot. If our source is a WAV file, then we've kind of got an unbroken stream already. Next is audio convert. This is the item that actually does the conversion of raw audio into a format that our destination format can use. Next, we have audio resample. If your output format has a different sample rate than the input format, this will do the resampling. The only reason this is part of our pipeline is because Sound Converter has an option to resample the audio but as you can see, I have that option disabled, so this actually won't do anything by itself here, since no new sample rate is specified in this pipeline. Next, we have FLAC Inc. This is what takes our raw decoded audio and encodes it into FLAC format. Mid side stereo equals true is an option that's hard coded into Sound Converter. Right here on line 633 of gstreamer.py, as you can see. Now, according to GStreamer's documentation, it actually defaults to true, so we don't really care about that one. Quality-8 is here because I selected the highest compression level possible in Sound Converter's preferences. And finally, we have our destination. Once again, I'm going to change this from GIO sync to file sync. I'll remove the file prefix. I'll fix the spaces. And I'm also going to rename this to grumpy dash gstlaunch.flac. That way I don't have to rename it myself later. So we're going to run this and you can see we have a file here. I can open it up, it works. And if I open it up in KID3, I can apply our tags. I'll save that. And as you can see, Dolphin does not show the cover art. So it is showing the same problem as Sound Converter was showing. So this is really great because we've completely eliminated Sound Converter from the equation. So we don't really need to look at Sound Converter's code at all anymore. We can just focus on GStreamer. But now, of course, we need to look at what part of GStreamer is causing the problem. So how do we find that? Well, the first thing I tried was taking away some of these options, audio rate, audio resample, that kind of thing. I tried adding another item to the pipeline, flak tag, which didn't do anything because you can't actually set tags using GST launch. This is a pretty simple pipeline now that we've looked at each piece individually. Once I kind of understood the pipeline thing, I figured the input type must not matter since the audio is being decoded first anyway. That was actually a bad assumption. I later found out this issue happens with WAV files, but not with MP3 files as the source. And I'll explain why later. But I decided to look at the FLAC Inc component because it's what's creating the FLAC files and the FLAC files were what I was having a problem with. So at that point, I looked up the source code for Flack Inc. GStreamer's source code is hosted on freedesktop.org's GitLab instance. And Flack Inc. is part of the GST plugins good repository, which is listed as part of the GStreamer project on GitLab. But even though I had access to the source code, I still didn't know what to look for because I still didn't know what was wrong with the Flack files. Remember, the tags saved in KID3 and they showed up in MPV, VLC, Quadlibet, and Lollipop. So the tags seemed to be working just fine. But I knew something had to be wrong with the FLAC files or different in some way that was causing KDE Elisa and Dolphin to not be able to read the metadata. Now the key word here is metadata. 
For a lot of this process, I was thinking of tags and metadata as being interchangeable words. But really, there's more metadata in a FLAC file than just the tags. Before I figured this out, I actually opened up a working FLAC file and a non-working FLAC file with the same tags side by side in Kwrite. Now, making any changes whatsoever and then saving causes the files to break because audio files aren't meant to be edited in text editors. But you can see near the top where some of the tags are listed. I was hoping to be able to spot a difference between the two that would explain why the non-working files are only readable by some programs. But even though I was able to see differences, I wasn't able to draw any conclusions since so much of that text is unreadable anyway. So next, I started looking at other ways to read FLAC file metadata. I figured there must be tools out there specifically to report on metadata of files, including FLAC files, and I was sort of correct, but there wasn't a super comprehensive FLAC file analyzer like I was hoping. I did web searches for FLAC file header structure and FLAC file header modifier. I ended up finding three tools. The first was a Perl library called Audio Flack Header. I used that library along with a script from the Ubuntu man page to print out some information, and in addition to the tags, it was also able to show me things like the sample rate, bit rate, channel, and vendor information. I compared those things between the working and non-working files, but even after I tweaked my GStreamer command to make them look as close as possible, I still wasn't able to explain the issue I was having. The second and third tools actually shed some light on the situation. The second tool was a Python library called Mutagen. It's a general multimedia metadata library, mainly for tagging, but it can also show other information like cue sheets and seek tables. The third tool was one I wish I had known about a lot sooner called Metaflack. Metaflack is a dedicated command from the actual FLAC program just for working with the metadata of FLAC files. I already had it installed since I was using the FLAC command for testing earlier. Both Mutagen and Metaflack were able to show me the answer I was looking for, but I ended up finding it with Metaflack first because it's a little more straightforward to use from the command line than a Python library is. Comparing the working and non-working files in Metaflack made it very easy to see what the difference was. And if you're still listening to my story here, you're hopefully just as curious as I was. So let me show you right now. So here we have our two files. Here's the one I made with GST launch, and here's the one I made with the flat command. I'm going to run this metaflat command on both files. I'm going to copy and paste these into two Kwrite windows. And looking at these side by side, you can see a very big difference here in the seek table section. The working file has a length of 162 and 9 seek points, while the non-working file has a length of 0 and 0 seek points. Finally, I had found a difference. Up until now, I had no proof that anything was wrong with GStreamer. I just knew that some files showed up in KDE Elisa, and some files didn't show up in KDE Elisa, and still showed up in other programs, which made Elisa look like it was doing something wrong. But after hours and hours of troubleshooting, I finally managed to find some quantitative evidence that GStreamer was messing up these files. The seek table was empty. Now at this point you might be thinking, what is a seek table? I sure didn't know, but that one was relatively easy to find information on. FLAC files can have a seek table that specifies a number of seek points, which are points throughout the audio stream that a player can seek to. Now a couple of notes about seek points. A seek table isn't strictly required. If a FLAC file doesn't have a seek table, most players can still seek to any point in time you want to go to just by starting at the beginning and fast forwarding through to the point that you want. They're able to do that instantly, so you're not usually able to tell the difference yourself. But without seek points, seeking around in the audio stream would require more IO reads of the file and might take slightly longer. One other thing, seek points aren't necessarily supposed to be points that you'd want to seek to, that would be a cue sheet. FLAC files can also have a cue sheet. For example, if you have a single FLAC file that contains an entire CD, your cue sheet might have an entry for every song. The cue sheet entries would probably be visibly displayed within your audio player. Seek points aren't visible in your audio player, and they're usually just equally spaced throughout a file. They're just there to help performance. Now check out what happens if I delete the seek table from the non-working file.
that was it. It got the file working. If a file had a valid seek table, KDE was able to read it. If a file had no seek table, KDE was able to read it. If a file had an invalid empty seek table, then KDE was not able to read it. So that was the core of the issue. Now GStreamer has an option you can pass into the Flack Inc encoder called seek points. Here's what the documentation says. If seek points is greater than zero, then it sets the number of seek points to add equally spaced. If seek points is less than zero, then it sets the interval in seconds for how far apart you want the seek points to be. The default value is negative 10. There's supposed to be a seek point every 10 seconds if you don't specify anything for this option, which I hadn't been. And by the way, this isn't documented, but if seek points equals zero, then GStreamer actually created the file without a seek table, which produced a working file. That made me confident enough that this was a bug to actually open a GitLab issue for it. Here's what my GitLab issue looked like at first. I like to give a brief summary of how I came across an issue, not to bore the developers, but to give them an idea of the context of how I found the issue and my intended usage that's leading me to report it. You can see at the bottom that I linked a point in the flacking code where seek points are set. I'll show you that pretty soon here. But for right now, it was already past 10 p.m. on a weeknight. I had to put this down. So I left it here, not sure what kind of response I'd see from the GStreamer developers. To my pleasant surprise, one of the developers responded just a few hours later. Shout out to Sebastian Drudge. He asked me for the pipeline I used to reproduce the issue with GST launch, and I gave it to him the next morning. Less than an hour later, he got back to me again, saying that if the input file doesn't allow GStreamer to query the total duration of the input before it starts writing the output, there won't be any seek points. Now, he says that will be the case for MP3 files, but not for WAV files. Earlier, I had found that this issue did not occur when the input file was an MP3 file. You can see I made an edit to my issue just after I posted it, adding that information. I knew my specific WAV files weren't the problem, since this happened with several completely unrelated WAV files from different sources, but it had occurred to me that it could be some kind of issue reading seek points from the input file rather than a problem writing seek points to the output file. I was actually concerned about the possibility of the problem being in the wave code rather than the flat code, because so far I'd only been looking at the flat side of things. For that reason, it was kind of reassuring to hear him assume that it was a problem on the flat side of GStreamer. Even though that was reassuring, he ended the message with a dreaded statement. Needs some further investigation. You always hope a developer will hear about your issue and know exactly where the problem lies, but this comment suggested it might be a while until he had time to track this one down. The last thing I want to mention here is Sebastian's speculation that the encoder needed to call an additional API to write the seek points that it was calculating to the file. I ended up finding some problems with this theory, which I'll get to towards the end of the video. Now I had already come so far at this point. I'd already used up an entire day of my free time on this, and now that I got some affirmation and a potential point in the right direction from a developer, I definitely wanted to see it through to the end. I knew what was coming up next, debugging. In my own words, not being a developer myself, I would describe debugging as analyzing code line by line until you find something that you think might be the issue, changing something to confirm whether or not that's the issue, compiling the code with your change, testing it, and repeating until you find the actual issue. It can take some time, but for me, the time isn't the worst part about it. I have problems with the setup. If I can take a copy of the source code and compile a version of the program that behaves the same way as the pre-compiled version I'm using from my package manager, then I'm fairly confident in my ability to find the problem eventually, even if it takes me a lot longer than it would take somebody more fluent in computer science. But some programs are more difficult to build than others, and if I can't get the unmodified version working, then I can't test my changes at all. Luckily, GStreamer is actually really easy to build from source. They've got very good documentation, and they have a repository you can clone that's specifically meant to be used for testing out changes during development. So now I'm going to show you how to build GStreamer from source with Flack support, and finally, how I tracked down the specific line of code that was causing the problem. Now I actually don't like developing on my own computer unless I'm able to have a very controlled environment. GStreamer's tools actually make it very easy to have a controlled environment, but I didn't know that going in. I thought I might have to overwrite my system-wide version of GStreamer with my custom compiled version, so I went ahead and switched away from my main machine at this point. I used a laptop with Pop OS, which already has a lot of the packages you need to build code from source, although there are a few more we'll need to add, and we'll see those in just a moment. All right, so here we are on the desktop. Now, like I said, the first thing you need to be able to do before you can start testing changes to the source code is actually get the unmodified source code building. This is the GitLab repository for GST build. Since GStreamer is such a big project, they actually have this repository that you can clone, and it includes a bunch of their other repositories, as you can see here in the subprojects directory. 
The FLAC encoder is part of GST plugins good, so we need the GStreamer base and GST plugins good. And you can see those things are included here. So the first thing we'll do is we'll open up a terminal and clone this repository. We're going to CD into there. And I didn't do this next step when I was working on fixing this issue, but at this point I actually need to check out a version of the program from before the issue was fixed because I'm demonstrating how I found the problem. So to do that, I'm just going to edit the GST plugins good wrap file here. And I'm going to specify the revision just before the fix was implemented. Now you can see in this directory there is a mason.build file. And on the readme page for GST build, you can see that we do need Mason and Ninja as dependencies for building GStreamer. So we'll install those with sudo apt install Mason. And then just like I covered in my previous video about building applications from source, if we try configuring this project with Mason build dir right now, you're going to see that we are still missing some dependencies. In particular, we need to install Flex. There are lots of things that were listed as not being found here, but after Flex was not found, the configuration actually stopped. Now I've been through this once already, so I'm just going to install everything that I know we'll need. But if you're doing something like this yourself for another project, it's not the most efficient way to do it. It's more efficient if the documentation for the project actually lists a complete set of dependencies. But if you're like me and you're just trying to get something building, you can do it with trial and error like that. So I'm going to install the rest of the dependencies. And if you don't install the libflack++ dev package, then when GStreamer builds, it actually won't include flack support, and we obviously need flack support to be able to test out the flack encoder. So now that that's done, we can run mason build dir again. And you can see there are still a lot of optional dependencies that it's not finding, but we don't need any of that for the testing that we're doing. We just need to be able to decode wave files and encode FLAC files, and we will have both of those things. So Mason just configured things for us, and it figured out what we have installed, and it enabled only the components that we have the necessary dependencies for. And next we're going to run ninja-c build dir. That's going to actually compile the code into executables that we can use. And finally, now that we have those executables, we can enter into the development environment with another ninja command. Now if I run which GST launch 1.0 right now, you can see that we're using the system-wide version of GStreamer, which is coming from the Ubuntu repository. But if we run ninja-c build dir devinv, this command is listed in the GST build readme. Now we're in the development environment, and if we run which GST launch 1.0 again, now you can see we're using our custom compiled version of GStreamer. So I'm just going to get a pipeline set up that we can use for testing. In this virtual desktop, I'll open up the source code of Flack Inc. and then I'll move our terminal to a new virtual desktop. And we'll actually run our GST launch command here to demonstrate that our custom-built GStreamer is working the same as the official release. So you can see that does run. And then in another virtual desktop, we'll open up another terminal. And in this one, we are going to run Metaflack. And you can see that we've got our seek table with length zero and seek point zero, so we can see that the issue is occurring here. So now when I want to make a change, I can go from top to bottom, change the code, rebuild GStreamer, run GST launch, and then check the file with Metaflack. Now I'm gonna go back up to the source code here. And the first thing I wanna do is find the code that's supposed to put the seek points into the seek table. 
Uh, now if I do a control F for seek point, we can see it's listed near the top uh, along with a bunch of other options. That doesn't look too interesting. We can see that we're defining the default value of negative 10. So there's supposed to be a seek point every 10 seconds if the user doesn't pass in anything for the seek points option. Next, we've got more property stuff here. But down here on line 701, this is where the seek points are actually supposed to get added. You can see in one of the debug messages here, adding seek point template failed. Now I wanna find out which of the code paths we're actually going down here. There are a lot of if statements. Are we making it into this entire if statement at all? If we are, then which one of these other if statements or else statements are we falling into? That's what I wanna find out. So to do that, I'm going to make the program a little more verbose by adding some lines to print out text to the console. I'll start by adding one right above this if statement. Now printf is a piece of code that you can use inside of a C or C++ program that's going to print out text to the console. What I'm doing here is I'm saying I want to print out this message. And a lot of times when I'm making modifications to code, I'll just put Jacob in all caps because that makes it really easy for me to find this message if it's scrolling through with a bunch of other text. It's gonna jump out at me since it's shouting my name. Now the backslash in before and after my message here, those are new line characters. I figured out pretty quickly you wanna include the new line characters, otherwise all of your different printf messages are just going to be strung together on one long line. So now the program will print this message out right before we enter into this if statement. And then I'm also going to add a printf message right inside of the if statement so we know whether or not we're making it in here. Now you can see we've got if statements for if the number of seek points that we're trying to add is greater than zero or else it's not greater than zero. In the GST launch command that I'm using to test right now, I'm setting seek points equal to 10. I'm trying to get the program to add 10 seek points in for me. And since the program didn't add any seek points last time I ran this, I want to find out if this option that I'm passing in is being read properly, or if it's perhaps not getting the number that I'm passing into it. So to find that out, I'm also going to add printf statements inside of this if statement and the else statement. Now I see a couple of debug messages that are already in here, but I don't actually know how to view the debug messages. So I'm also going to add in a few printf messages next to those debug messages, just so I know that I'll see them if they're relevant. And then finally, I'll also add a line to print out when we're about to actually add the seek table entry to the file. All right, so I'll save that and we'll go ahead and exit out of our development environment. I'm going to use our ninja builder command to rebuild and you can see it only needs to rebuild the file that I changed and then we will enter into the development environment and run our GST launch command again. So once again, seek points I'm setting equal to 10 here and you can see we are about to add seek points. We did go into that if statement because I see the adding seek points now message. It looks like our seek points number that we're passing in is getting read properly because 10 is greater than zero and you can see that seek point is greater than zero here. And we've got adding an entry, which is the point where it's adding the seek table to the file. Even though if we come down here and we run our metaflat command, we can see the seek table is still empty. But now we know that that adding an entry message, that's when it's adding the seek table entry, not necessarily any particular seek points. Now, just to demonstrate the greater than or less than code paths, if I come in here and I set seek points equal to negative 10 and I run that again, now you can see that seek points is not greater than zero. And then we add an entry, uh, but if we check with Metaflack, our seek table is still empty. So we know that we're making it into these two if statements, but neither one of them are working. And by the way, we can see that there's a part in the code that's supposed to handle if the total time is unknown. And this is why when we use an MP3 file as the source, we don't have any problems. You remember Sebastian mentioned in his message on the GitLab issue that for formats like MP3, where the encoder can't read the entire duration of the track before it starts writing the output, it can't add a seek table. And so when the code doesn't add the seek table at all, we already know that it produces a working file rather than a file with a broken seek table. So this is happening when the file thinks that it should be adding a seek table, and it is indeed adding a seek table, but it's not adding any seek points. Now these functions right here 
are the functions that are actually supposed to be adding the seek points to the seek table. We've got flac, metadata, object, seek table, append, spaced points. So this is if our seek points is greater than zero. So if I specify I want 10 seek points, it's going to specify 10 equally spaced seek points. And then we've got flac, metadata, object, seek table, template, append, space, points by samples. So if our seek points is not greater than 10, if we pass in the default value of negative 10, we're supposed to have a seek point every 10 seconds. And that's what this function is supposed to do. Now, if we just do a really quick web search for one of those options, you can see that these options are actually part of the flac library. And if we click on this to see a little bit more information, and we can see that these functions from this documentation, they're supposed to receive three pieces of information as their input. We're supposed to have a flac stream metadata object. We're supposed to have a number of seek points or the number of samples apart that the seek points are supposed to be. And then we're supposed to have the total number of samples as the final piece of information that we're passing in. And we can see that in both of these cases, we are passing in one, two, three pieces of information. So these statements appear to be formed correctly. And then the reason why we're setting a variable equal to that function is because the function will return a true or false Boolean value based on whether or not this was successful or failing. And we know that it's returning successful, it's returning true, because if this was false, then we would have gotten this adding seek point template failed message, but it didn't give us that message. We got our adding an entry message which means that res here was true. So we know that we're not getting an error back out of this function, but it doesn't seem to be giving us the data, the seek points that we're wanting. So I want to know what exact values we're actually passing in here, because these are all variables. Obviously none of these are numbers, because the numbers are gonna change based on our input file. So up here, before we get to those if statements, let's print out the values of some of these variables. Using the positive case here, just for example purposes, we know from the documentation we're supposed to be passing in the number of seek points we want and the total number of samples. So let's just confirm that we're actually passing in good data because you know if we put garbage into this function, it'll give us garbage back out. So up here I'll put printf, and what I'm going to do is put percent %d, and what that's going to do is let me put the name of a numeric variable and it will print it out in string form for us. And the space here is just so that we don't have multiple numbers running together once again. So we'll print out the seek points value and then we will print out total samples. So we'll save that. We will rebuild, enter our dev environment and run this. All right, so you can see Jacob adding seek points now and I'm actually going to go and once again, we'll use the positive test case here. Uh, and we are passing in the number of seek points that we want, which is 10. However, total samples, you can see here, for some reason, it's outputting zero. I can double check here. My printf statement was supposed to print the value of total samples. So if total samples is equal to zero up here, then it's still gonna be equal to zero down here because we're not setting it in between these two points. So we're passing in a total samples number of zero into this function. Now I'm no FLAC file expert, but since an audio file is made up of samples, it seems like the file should have more than zero samples. Having zero samples would be like having a video with zero frames. It just doesn't seem correct. So now we have to work our way backwards. Where is total samples getting set? Now if we come back up to line 569, we see that total samples is being passed into the GST flac inc set metadata function. So somewhere else in our code, we're calling this function and we're passing in a number and that number is becoming the total samples variable within this function. So let's find where we're calling GST flac inc set metadata. I'll copy that. I'll do a control F and I'll paste it in. It appears twice in our file, once right here where it's being defined and the other one is down here. We're on line 912. We're calling GST flac inc set metadata and we're passing in that total samples number here. So this is actually another variable also called total samples and we're passing total samples from this function into the set metadata function where we're also calling it total samples but let's see where it's getting set here. Uh, you can see here's where we're actually setting the value of total samples here within our GST flac inc set format function. Total samples is getting set to GST flac inc peer query total samples. So that's another function that we're calling and we're passing into that function these two pieces of information, flac inc and GST audio encoder sync pad inc. 
Now, just to confirm that we're on the right track here, I wanna find out what total samples is being set to at this part of the code, because total samples is being set here, then we're passing it into this other function. So let's make sure nothing is going wrong in between here and where we're using it later. So let's add in another printf line. I'm going to say line 901, and I'll put a space, and then we'll do a printf percent %d, and we'll print out total samples once again. So we'll save that, rebuild, and we will run this again. And you can see line 901 and our total samples is still equal to zero there. So we need to keep going backwards. Why is this getting set to zero? Well, let's find this function that we're calling here that's returning zero, GST flack inc peer query total samples. I'll do a control F once again. And up here on line 826, you can see we're taking in a GST flack encoder object and a GST pad object, and we're returning a duration value. All right, and we can see we've got a number of if statements in here, once again, with some debug messages, but we're not seeing the output of any of these debug messages in our program output. So just like I did before, I'm just going to add in a corresponding printf line to each one of these. And by the way, when we see these debug objects, the first item that we're passing into that GST debug object function is what this debug message is for. Uh, since printf doesn't care why we're printing something out, we're only going to include the actual string we want to print. So we've got querying peer for default format duration, and I'll add our new lines. Querying peer for time format duration, peer reported duration, and I'm just going to copy what's inside of here. It's actually going to work in the printf statement. I did not know whether or not it would work when I was doing this the first time, but I know it will work now. So we'll save that. And then we've got one down here, printf, upstream reported, no total samples. All right, so I'll save that. And once again, you can see why I set the pipeline up here because it is a bit repetitive, continuing to make changes and rebuild. Uh, but this gave us a little bit more information. So you can see querying peer for default format duration, querying peer for time format duration, and here, you can see peer reported duration, and then we've got a duration value. Now, one minute and 22 seconds is exactly how long the track that I'm testing with is. So GStreamer knows how long our track is in minutes and seconds. Uh, but let's see what we're actually reporting for our duration. So right before we return our duration value, I'm going to do printf percent %d duration, and I'll put a message right before there saying duration. All right, so we are reading our time duration properly, a minute and 22 seconds, but we're returning zero for the duration in samples. Now the line where we're setting the duration variable is right here. So to find the value of the duration variable, we are taking the old value of the duration variable and running it through the GST clock time to frames function with another piece of information, GST audio info rate info. Now from the name of this function and from what's going on in the code here, I can kind of guess what this is doing. The code finds and reports the duration in minutes and seconds of our track, and then we're converting clock time to frames. We're taking the number of minutes and seconds and we're converting it to the number of samples. And to do that, we're taking the number of minutes and seconds and multiplying it by the sample rate, the number of samples per second. All right, well, it seems like we're able to read the duration in minutes and seconds properly, so let's find out what we're passing in here as our sample rate. I'm going to copy that, and we're going to do a printf gst audio info rate info, and then we'll do a printf percent %d. All right, so let's run that. Okay, and this is getting a little messy here. I forgot to put a new line at the beginning of this new printf entry, but you can see GST audio info rate info is zero. So our duration, our number of samples is being set to zero because our sample rate is being reported as zero. If we have zero samples per second, then it doesn't matter how long the track is. We're going to have zero samples total because zero times anything is zero. Now to test if this is the problem, 
I am going to add a new line character there just so that that's not as messy. But to test if this is actually the problem, I'm going to replace this variable in here. Instead of passing in this variable to the GST clock time to frames function, I'm going to pass in what I know is our actual sample rate, 44,100. This is CD quality, so every second we're going to have 44,100 samples. Let's see what happens when we hard code that value in. I see a difference here. On line 901, instead of having a duration of zero, our duration is being reported as 3,649,655. Quite a big difference. So now that we've seen that, let's go ahead and run Metaflack again. Aha! You can see here that we have our 10 samples, zero through nine. This is what the program is supposed to be doing, is creating 10 samples if we set seek points equal to 10. So the problem is that GST audio info rate info is reporting a sample rate of zero. Now, why the heck is that happening? We just have to keep going deeper. Now, at this point, I started looking for where GST audio info rate info is getting set because that must be getting set somewhere. Now, once again, by doing a web search, I can quickly find information about that piece of code. First, I've got an entire page on the GStreamer documentation site talking about GST audio info. And we can see down here that GST audio info rate info is going to return the rate value for the info object. Now, what I can also see from our web search is that we need to be looking inside of GST plugins base rather than GST plugins good. And after doing a bit more searching, I ended up finding the file where I think that's getting set. And that's at GST plugins base, GST libs, GST audio, audio info .c. Now I didn't end up finding the exact issue in this file, but let me show you what I did find. If we come down to line 131, we can see we've got a function, GST audio info set format, and this function gets an integer passed into it, which it refers to as the rate. Down on line 148, we're setting GST audio info rate info equal to that variable. And like I just showed you, the info with an arrow pointing to rate is equal to audio rate with info in the parentheses. We saw that on the GStreamer documentation page. So I wanted to find out what was going on with the rate. And here are all of the printf lines that I ended up adding. First off, I wanted to see what piece of information, what number was being passed into this function in the first place. So I added a printf line right at the top, audio rate at beginning of GST audio info set format. And we're just going to print out the value of that rate variable. I saw a line down here with init in the name. And so I went ahead and added a line before that, audio rate before init. And then I also added in audio rate after init so the point of this is to see whether or not this init function is affecting the rate or not. And at this point, it's kind of obvious to me that it's not, but I'm just throwing in all the lines that I added when I was looking into this the first time through. Down here is where we're actually setting info rate equal to the rate number. And that's why it's obvious to me that this init line, it's, it's acting on info, but it's not acting on the rate variable. And we hadn't set info rate equal to rate yet. So there's no way that that would have done anything with the rate variable. But down here, we are setting info rate equal to rate. So let's see after we set that, if we can read it back correctly. printf audio info dot c info rate info rate. I also added some things down here. I wanted to figure out what this whole mess of if and return statements was doing. So I said, okay, we're returning with a mono position. And then down here, we're returning with a stereo position or else we're not mono or stereo. I also added in some more printf statements throughout the rest of this, but it actually doesn't have anything to do with the issue, so I'll just skip those. Now I also added in some print statements inside of GST audio info from caps here, because I wanted to see where we were calling GST audio info set format and passing in the rate value, and we are calling that down here inside of GST audio info from caps. So something is calling this function, um, and this is where we are passing in once again, a variable called rate into our other function. So I wanted to find out what rate was set to down here. So I added in printf, we're sending this rate to GST audio info set format. And so then we're printing out rate there. 
And where is rate even being set in the first place? Because if this is a variable, we must be setting it to a value somewhere if we're passing it in here, or we should be setting it to a value somewhere. So if we scroll up a bit, well, I can see we've got a case here for if we don't have a rate. So I can go ahead and just add in printf, we're going to no rate. That way I'll know if this section of code is even relevant or if I don't need to look at that. And for this section here, I do need to add in some curly braces because this if statement, it was written with shorthand. You don't need to put a brace if you're only putting one line of code inside the if statement. But now that we've got two lines of code, I'm gonna add the braces. So we'll go ahead and build this again. And you can see we are getting a lot more warnings now than we were earlier. And that's because I'm adding all of these printf statements that aren't all entirely semantically correct. There's a reason the program wasn't written this way in the first place, but it's correct enough to compile and that's enough for me. So we're gonna come in here and we're gonna run our GST launch command again. And we're getting a lot more output now. And you can see we actually loop through that section that we just added the printf lines to multiple times. Uh, but here's what I'm seeing. Even though we are initializing that rate variable with zero, I know that it's being set properly by the end of this function. Because when we get down here and I say we're sending this rate to GST audio info set format, when we get to that point, we're sending 44100. That is the correct sample rate. And this was helpful to see because now I knew that it wasn't an issue with the wave decoder not being able to read the rate or anything like that. GStreamer is aware of the correct rate in audioinfo.c, but for some reason it's being returned to zero within gstflacinc.c. Now at this point, I actually stopped again. It was getting late again, it's still a weekday, so I added a comment to the GitLab issue with what I found. On this line in gstflacinc.c, duration is getting set to zero because GST audio info rate info is getting set to zero. I hadn't actually found the root cause of that, but this is still way deeper and more specific than just reporting that the seek table didn't have any seek points. And at that point, the GStreamer developers jumped in exactly how I was hoping they would. Sebastian came back a few hours later and said, yep, that's the issue. And when I woke up the next morning, he had already submitted a merge request to fix the issue. Let's take a look. So as you can see here in his merge request, here's what he did to fix the issue. There's a function called GST flac inc peer query total samples, which is supposed to return the total number of samples in the file. We call that function and we set the total samples variable equal to the result. One of the things that's used inside of that function is a GST audio info object called info, which is supposed to include the sample rate like we looked at earlier. Before, we were setting the value of info equal to the output of GST audio encoder get audio info within this function. But we actually already have an info object by the time we get down to this line that calls GST flac inc peer query total samples. And the info object that we have is the one that has the sample rate, which we need to have in order to calculate the total samples. So what we needed to do instead was pass that info object, which includes the sample rate, into the GST flac inc peer query total samples function as an additional argument. Now that this change has been made, this function will use the value of the existing info object instead of trying to create a new one, which clearly was not working properly before. If we come back to the overview, Sebastian actually included my name in the merge request. He said, thanks to Jacob Kaufman for debugging this and finding the main cause. And now this fix has already been merged into the master branch of GST plugins good, but the master branch hasn't been released with a version number since that happened. So my distribution, Arch Linux, hasn't received the updated version with the fix yet. However, what I'm able to do since I'm on Arch is install the GST plugins good git package from the AUR, and this is going to pull in the master branch and install it with the fix on my system. So I'm just going to cd into my AUR directory here. I'm going to clone that AUR package. I'm going to cd into it, and I'm going to install it. All right, and it looks like to run the Git version of GST plugins good, I also need to have the Git version of GST plugins base. So I'll go ahead and install that as well. All right, so that is now installed. I can open up my directory with my files in it one more time. I'm going to go ahead and delete the broken file and our other testing FLAC files that I was using. I can open up this WAV file inside of Sound Converter one more time. And I'm going to do what I did at the beginning of this video. I'm just going to convert it with Sound Converter. Um, so we'll check our preferences, same folder, best possible compression. We'll click Convert. And we can see we've got a FLAC file. I'm going to add the tags and the cover art with KID3.
And when I click save here, as you can see, Dolphin sees the cover art, and I can copy this file into my music directory. And if I open up KDE Elisa one more time, you can see at the top right it says imported one track. I can search for it, and I can play it. So that brings us to the end of our journey. Guys, this is why I love free software. This is what software freedom is all about. I, as a user, was experiencing a problem. I decided it was worth my time to figure out why the problem was happening, because I had already run into this once and then forgotten about it and ran into it again. And I figured I would probably run into it again in the future. So I sat down and dug into it for a couple of days. Now the GStreamer developers would have been able to figure this issue out eventually, but Sebastian's initial guess that the flak stream encoder finish function wasn't sufficient to write the seek table entries was incorrect. The seek table template functions are supposed to put the seek points into the template. And in a huge project like GStreamer, they've got thousands of open issues. GST plugins good alone has over 580 issues open right now. So it might have taken them a while to get around to debugging it themselves. I was the one who was ultimately affected by this bug, and the software being free empowered me to put that time and effort in to track down the root cause. And Sebastian was awesome. He got back to me very quickly, and he was the one who ended up making that merge request to fix the issue after I triangulated it to the best of my ability. This was just an absolutely optimal interaction with open source developers. I have a lot of respect for the GStreamer project and its developers like Sebastian after this experience. So if you made it to the end of this video, I hope you found it entertaining. I hope you found it helpful. I know it was a really long story. I actually tweeted out a screenshot of my desktop the first night that I was working on this. And that screenshot is really great because there's so much packed into it. Of course, I had a thousand open tabs in my web browser. I've got a years old launchpad bug with low priority and an incomplete status. I've got a bunch of KWrite windows open from when I was staring and comparing between the different FLAC files. You can see I've got one of the Psychopass files open in the background that I was comparing this new file to. I had Audacity open because I was using it to export a FLAC file and comparing that to GStreamer's FLAC file. But then of course I left Audacity open Open way after I was done using it, so I've just got the waveforms sitting there. You can see my wonderfully named python.py and perl.perl files that I was using to try and analyze the FLAC files. I've got a calculator that I was using to figure out how many samples the FLAC files should have and where the seek points should be getting added in. I've got a couple of windows open that have nothing to do with this project because I was using this virtual desktop for something else before I ran into this bug and started looking into it. And then I've got the culmination of that first day of work, a nicely written GitLab issue opened by me. All of this really goes to show you don't necessarily need to have a degree in computer science or formal development experience to contribute to free and open source software. Now, five years ago, I probably would not have been able to do this. A year and a half ago, when I ran into this issue, I didn't do this. But over time, I've gotten more and more comfortable gathering information and interacting with open source developers. I've gotten more comfortable through years of using open source software and reading GitHub and GitLab issues. So these days, if I've got an issue that I really want to see resolved, I'm not an expert, but I have enough experience to know what information I need to present and how I need to present it to have a good chance of solving the issue. This fix is going to benefit everyone. Anyone using Sound Converter or any other GStreamer based program will no longer have this problem when creating FLAC files. I'd love to do more of this stuff in the future. Feel free to support me at nerdclub.nots.co for just $3 a month if you want to see more technical content like this and more contributions to the free software community. For now though, that just about wraps it up. So I'm Jacob Kauf and I'm the Nerd in the Street and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.